Hi guys, today you're going to be learning about derivatives of trig functions. There is a song that goes with this. If I play it now, it will be a little bit crazy. You won't be able to understand maybe all of the words. So I'm going to play it um, at the end once we have been able to define all of those derivatives. Um, before we can start really talking about the derivative, we need to actually recall a few things. Um, some of those trig identities that are going to come up and um, also another theorem that we had about limits. So let's start with the trig identities. The main ones that you need to be, again, familiar with would be the Pythagorean identities. Those will come in handy for us, like sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And remembering that you can manipulate sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 into other equations, like 1 minus sine squared equals cosine squared. Um, another one would be 1 plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared. And the last Pythagorean one, 1 plus cotangent squared, is equal to cosecant squared. So those are all going to be very important. Um, in addition to the Pythagorean identities that are a little bit harder to remember, you do need to know the reciprocal identities, like sine equals 1 over cosecant, or cosecant is 1 over sine. And also the quotient identities, which tells us that uh, tangent is sine over cosine, and cotangent is cosine over sine. Um, so take a moment to write those down, pause the video if you want, and then we'll move on. Um, there is another trig identity that we're going to be actually using here pretty quick um, to talk about the derivative, and that is a sum formula for sine, so the sine of a plus b. Again, a and b in this case are angles. Um, and so if we have the sine of a plus b, we know that that's the sine of a times the cosine of b plus the cosine of a times the sine of b. And that's going to be very, very important to us. Um, in addition to the trig identities that we talked about last year, uh, there is another theorem that we need to recall. Theorem, I believe, 2.6.4. It's on page 157 in your textbook, uh, which tells us that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. It also tells us that the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus the cosine of x over x is equal to 0. Okay, So those two are also going to come in handy here. All right, um, so what we're going to do is start by finding the derivative of sine. Um, and I'm actually going to show you how we find the derivative of sine using the definition of a derivative. We could actually do this for all six trig functions. We're not going to take the time to do that. Uh, once you see the one for sine, hopefully you'll trust that um, the other ones are uh, would follow suit. If you are interested in that, I think I'm going to look for just a moment. So, oh, they are not all in your book, all the proofs of them. However, you could look them up and see for yourself. And if you're interested, I can um, maybe help you work through a couple of those if you want. Um, so, we're going to actually start out with f of x equals sine of x, um, where now instead of using theta, we're going to use x is going to be an angle measure in radians. Okay. Um, we will never, ever in calculus, oh, I shouldn't say never, ever. Most likely in calculus, most of the time, we will not see any angle measures in degrees. We're always going to be talking about radians. Okay. So um, let me remind you again about the definition of a derivative. It says that we would have the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So if I'm applying that to our function sine x, we'll have f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of the sine of x plus h minus the sine of x all over h. This is where we're going to use the trig identity for the sum formula with the um, sine. So we will now have that this is the limit as h approaches 0 of sine x 
times the cosine of h plus the cosine of x times the sine of h minus the sine of x all over h. Now we're going to strategically split this fraction up to help us out. And if you were just kind of starting this from scratch and doing this on your own, it would be a little bit of trial and error and having to think about it. But since you're not having to do it on your own from scratch, you can just know that we're going to break it up in a strategic manner. So I'm going to have um, the limit of sine x cosine h minus sine x all over h. So I took the first term and this last term over here, the minus sine, and put it over h. Plus, now I'll have to have the second term also over h, cosine x sine h over h. And this is going to help me be able to get these in a form where we know some limits, which is going to be helpful. So here's what I'm going to do. In the first fraction, I'm going to take out a sine x. And what that's going to leave me with is cosine of h minus 1 all over h. Or I can just really have that part over h. And what I'm going to do on the second fraction is say that this is the cosine of x times the sine of h over h. Um, I'm going to have to erase. We can't fit one whole problem on this teeny tiny board. So I'm going to erase um, and we'll know that we're starting over from here. Okay. Um, the next thing I'm going to do, and before I erase that last line, is I'm going to recognize that if I have a limit of a sum, that's the sum of the limits, and then I would have the limit of products here and another limit of products here, which is the product of the limits. So I'll be able to do the limit of sine. And then I have this one, which is kind of interesting because it's very, very similar to the theorem that we talked about, but it's not exactly the same. The theorem was one minus cosine. So in order to make that a one minus cosine, I'm actually going to take out a negative one. Okay. Um, and then I also know um, this is going to be nice because I'll be able to do the limit of the cosine and we know something about the limit of sine h over h according to the theorem again. So this one is just the cosine of x times sine h over h. Now, we already talked about um, how we can apply limits here. Also, I'm going to, since I'm just multiplying here, I can actually take this negative and apply it to the sine. So I'm going to be looking at having the limit as h approaches 0 of negative sine of x, interesting, times the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine h over h, plus the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine x times the limit as h approaches 0 of sine h over h. All right, and here's what we find out. We cannot um, do anything with a limit. Well, the limit as um, h approaches 0 of negative sine x is simply um, negative sine x. Okay. The limit as h approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine h over h is 0. The limit as h approaches 0 of cosine x is the cosine of x because there's no h to impact it. And the limit as h approaches 0 of sine h over h, again, according to our theorem, is 1. So what ends up happening is that we get 0 plus cosine of x, and we find out 
that f prime of x then is the cosine of x. All right, sorry, my computer turned off there and I had to re-sign back on. And the board was falling. Okay. All right, so now what we know um, are a few things. I'm going to leave this here. So, d dx of sine x, we just proved, was cosine x. Okay. d dx of cosine x is actually negative sine x. And again, we could go through a similar process using the definition of a derivative to find that out. If you're interested, let me know. Okay. Then we have d dx of tangent. And I hope I have room over there. It is secant squared. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. We have two more. We need the derivative of cosecant, which is negative cosecant cotangent. And lastly, the derivative of secant is positive secant x tangent x. Okay. I think this is a good place for our song, so you can listen to this while you're finished copying all of those things down. Here we go. tangent is secant squared and the derivative of secant is secant tangent, then the derivatives of their co-functions, okay, so for instance, secant to cosecant is um, the derivatives of co-functions are always going to be negative and you just substitute the co-functions in. So the co-function of secant is cosecant, the co-function of tangent is cotangent. The same thing here, the derivative of cosine then is negative and the co-function of cosine is sine. And then the derivative of cotangent, which is going to be a negative, um, we substitute in instead of secant squared, we would have its co-function, cosecant squared. So you really, if you can remember that, those rules, then you really just need to remember three of those derivatives, okay? All right, let's look at some examples of solving or finding derivatives of trig functions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to tell you that uh, this is going to be a little bit interesting. We're going to do two examples in this video. Um, and then I'm going to stop this video. And I'm going to come back and do another video later with a third example um, that will take quite a bit of space. So um, there'll be two different videos that you need to watch here. All right. So this will be example number one, find f prime of x, okay? Um, so we've got f of x is equal to 4 cosine x 
plus 2 sine x. So f prime of x is then d dx of 4 cosine x plus 2 sine x. Or d dx of 4 cosine x plus d dx 2 sine x. But we also know that constant multipliers can actually come out front. So we have 4 um, d dx cosine x plus 2 d dx sine x. Then we simply use those trig derivatives. So we know that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And we know that the derivative of sine is cosine. Uh, then we'll clean that up just a little bit and call that 4, or sorry, negative, Hello. negative 4 sine x plus 2 cosine x is f prime of x. Okay. Now, that one was pretty straightforward, finding those derivatives. Okay. Let's look at one that uh, will involve another rule that you have learned. Um, f of x equals secant tangent. Secant x tangent x. So in this case we are actually multiplying two trig functions together and we want to find the derivative of that. So we're going to need to use the product rule. So f prime of x says uh, and if you remember the sum, first d last, so the first function times the derivative of the second plus um, the last function times the derivative of the first. So we're going to leave secant x alone, and we need to find the derivative of tangent x. Pretty straightforward again, secant squared x. And we have tangent x times the derivative of secant x. The derivative of secant x is secant tangent. Finally, we will simplify here. Secant times secant squared is secant cubed. Tangent times secant tangent is tangent squared secant. And that's the derivative of secant tangent. Now, uh, once in a while we might try to manipulate this to try to make it look a little bit nicer. Um, that's not going to do us any good if we were to um, factor out a secant. We would leave us with secant squared plus tangent squared, which is not a trig identity, which will turn into something a little bit simpler to deal with. So we're just going to leave this one alone and call that the answer, okay? Okay, I'm going to stop this video, and then um, on the next video that you're going to watch, so uh, click on the next link, you're going to see the next example. Um, I'm just going to warn you that it took me about half of a page, maybe a little more than half of a page, so you might need to start the next example on a new page, okay? All right, um, I'm stopping this one, and click on the next one.